Welcome to this online lesson considering what was the impact of the terrain of the First World War on the wounded. The aims of this lesson are to gain knowledge of the terrain in World War I and therefore to support an opinion to so with sources and to evaluate those sources. Again, bearing in mind our newly gained knowledge on the terrain of World War I. Let's consider two examples to start with. The first picture shows a stretcher team in the mud near Ypres in Belgium. This is on the western front of the First World War. The picture was originally black and white, but has been colourised. On the right-hand side, we can see an Australian soldier who's carrying a wounded man on the hot cliffs of Gallipoli in the Middle East. You'll do now a task. What challenges do the men face in each photograph? Secondly, how are the challenges different? Thirdly, which landscape is most dangerous for the wounded? Pause the video here while you note down some ideas for that, and then we'll go through some potential answers. First of all, we probably noticed the thick mud in the first picture uh, based around Ypres. This would have made it incredibly difficult, dangerous, slippery and slow to move the wounded or indeed anything else across the battlefield in that area. On the other hand, the ground is a lot drier and firmer at Gallipoli, but it has its own challenges too. Notice all the rocks in the background. There would have been plenty of opportunities for these soldiers to fall over and injure themselves. How are the challenges different? Well, one is going to be hot and arid and very thirst-provoking, whereas the other one is going to be very cold, wet and miserable. So neither of them are particularly nice environments. So which landscape is most dangerous for the wounded? Well, for the wounded, probably the situation where the soldiers were very slow. Time was often of the essence when it came to trying to treat these wounded soldiers, and so delays in getting bogged down in the mud could cost someone their life. In Gallipoli, on the other hand, the risk of infection is lower from the mud, but also uh, the soldier is less likely to go into shock because of uh, the, there's less cold there. And if they're able to be moved across the battlefield quickly, they're going to get treated more quickly as well. That's not to say that Gallipoli wasn't dangerous. Look how open that countryside is. That man would have been a prime target for any snipers who didn't want to respect the fact that he was just helping out a wounded comrade. We're going to be focusing largely on the conditions like that shown on the left, though. After all, this source investigation is focused on the British Army on the Western Front. The terrain of war. We tend to think of World War I as being a nightmare of mud and rain, but it was far more varied horror than that. Men got wounded in many landscapes and situations. Mud and filth in the trenches, heat and sunshine of the mini at the Middle East, the cramped confines of warships, and the flimsy, flammable frames of aircraft. This topic focuses on the trenches of the Western Front, however. So how might the terrain prove challenging in healing the wounded? Note down some ideas now before we proceed. These two photographs demonstrate and illustrate very well what we're talking about here. A devastated landscape. Study the two photographs of the town of Passchendaele near Ypres. One shows the landscape before the battle in 1916, the other 12 months later after the battle had ended in November 1917. A huge difference. To give you a sense of the bearings, look for the road network and the ruined church, and then compare that to the photo in 1916. Look back to the November 1917 photograph now. Every single white spot that you see in that photograph, many of them overlapping, is a water-filled shell hole. So what weapons would have caused this devastation? And what challenges would medical services face in this situation? And try and be specific about this. Be specific about the problems of infrastructure and transport, for example. Pause the video here. So the main weapon that causes this devastation is artillery. Large cannon that fire high explosive shells that devastate the landscape, blowing up buildings, making shell craters and churning up the already muddy soil. So what challenges would medical services face in this situation? Well, notice in November 1917, the roads are still able to be made out. This is because great efforts went to keeping these roads more or less open, obviously not in prime condition, but just about usable. Transport was incredibly important. Any delays in transporting the wounded to where they needed to be treated could be fatal. Even a light railway was laid up to the uh, town of, uh, of Passchendaele in order to take ammunition in and take the wounded out. 
but anything that might devastate those supply routes could be fatal for the wounded soldiers. We're now going to consider the differences between usefulness and reliability. In your exam, you will be asked about usefulness, and it's important not to mix this up with reliability. Historians always use evidence to find out about the past, but some evidence is more useful than others. In order to gauge usefulness, you need to consider what you're using the source for. So here's an example. How useful is this source for a historian studying conditions in the trenches in World War I? Here we've got two British soldiers in a flooded trench near Ypres. The photo was taken from 1917. First, check the caption and provenance. Then think, is this R-E-A-L, real? Let's check the caption first of all. Does this photograph appear to be relevant? What to? Is it relevant to studying conditions in the trenches in World War I? So it says two British soldiers in a flooded trench near Ypres. And it's taken in 1917. 1917 is in World War I. And it is of a trench. Therefore, the information is relevant. Is it enough? Does this source contain enough information to help you? Well, it can include quite a few things. We can see the uniforms that the soldiers are wearing. We can see the poor condition of the trench. We can see the fact that they are flooded almost up to their knees. So it gives some indication about the conditions of the trenches. That said, though, we don't know how typical this is. Surely trenches weren't always like this. This one looks like it's a flooded trench or possibly even a wrecked trench as well. So it may not be entirely typical. Let's consider the author. Do you know who made it? Could they be biased or one-sided? Why was it made? Well, we don't know who took this photograph, but we can probably infer that it was taken by a fellow soldier, given the fact that the two men look pretty comfortable uh, just looking at the uh, photographer. To give you a bit of extra, extra knowledge here, Soldiers weren't really allowed to take photographs in the trenches for security reasons. Obviously many did, and the authorities could turn a bit of, bit of a blind eye to this because they had bigger problems to complain about. But we can infer that this was taken by a soldier. Could they be biased? Well, possibly, but the only way that they can be biased is by framing the photograph to demonstrate to make a point. Possibly they're trying to make a point here that the conditions of the trenches were awful. So this could be representative of that, or perhaps they've posed the photograph to exaggerate how awful it was. Nevertheless, our limited information about the author makes that a bit of a tricky one. Let's consider the limitations then. We've already considered a few of these. Is there anything about this which doesn't seem trustworthy? Well, I've already mentioned that perhaps these soldiers seem to have been posed. After all, their uniforms don't look that muddy below the knees, so possibly they haven't been there that long or they've just walked over to this flooded section to make the point about how awful it is. And is it typical of what we know? Well, do we know that conditions were muddy and awful at Ypres in 1917? Yes, we sort of do. So that might fit in well, well with our knowledge. But we also know that not every trench was like this, and surely no, not all the trenches could have been uh, kept like this all the time. So perhaps it isn't as typical as it could, could look, and that's a limitation. You can pause the video here and have a bit of a practice at that, writing down your own notes for how relevant this source is to the inquiry. Remember, that's studying conditions in trenches. Whether it provides us with enough information, what we could say about the author and who made it, and also any limitations. Pause the video while you do that. Okay, have you recorded your thoughts under those headings? Now you've done that, answer the question. How useful is this source for a historian studying conditions in trenches in World War I? Remember you will need to come to a judgment here. Say what is useful about it, say what isn't useful about it, and then decide how useful it is. Very useful, not as useful, quite useful, you decide how you want to phrase it. Spend five or six minutes answering that question now. Pause the video while you do so. Okay, it's worth bearing in mind that this is very similar to one of the questions you're going to have to answer in paper one, and indeed one of the uh, questions that you'd have to answer in paper three if you're doing the Pearson Edexcel qualification. First of all, the similarity is that you will be asked a question about how useful a source is. However, you'll be asked to have two sources and consider them both. You'd usually be worth eight marks. You'd spend about 12 minutes on this. We spent a little bit shorter on this one here because we're only studying the one source. But it's still valuable skills practice for you. Now we're going to have a look at two sources. Now this is a proper exam style question, an eight mark one. 
How useful are sources A and B for an inquiry into the impact of the nature of the fighting on caring for the wounded? Explain your answer using sources A and B in their historical context. Right, that's very wordy, but here's what it basically means. You're deciding how useful these sources are. In other words, do they provide you with relevant enough information that you can trust? And for this inquiry, the impact on the nature of the fighting on caring for the wounded. So how did the nature of the, the fighting and the circumstances in World War I impact on the wounded? That's what you're trying to find out. Do these sources give you relevant enough information? Then explain your answer using sources A and B in the historical context means use your knowledge of the fighting in World War I, the terrain, the conditions, the weapons and so forth in order to understand what these uh, sources are talking about. That will be your contextual knowledge and you can get extra marks for that. And when I say extra marks, it means that you'll be able to pick up marks within the exam for relating these sources to what you already know. For this question, you need to think about the information in the sources and how much you can trust the information. Study each source now and assess, are they real? Okay, note down those headings again. Relevant, enough, author, limitations. Jot down a few ideas under each of those headings for each source. Spend two or three minutes doing this and pause the video now. Okay, hopefully you're able now to work out how useful these sources are. As a top tip, the examiner is never really going to give you an exam, a, a, a source within the exam that isn't useful. That'd be a waste of your time, their time, everybody's time. So always assume that the sources are useful, at least to an extent. However, some sources will be more useful than others, and you can comment upon this. For example, source A is useful. An example from the source is... This source tells me I can trust this source and you can comment on things like the author, where it's come from, the purpose behind it and so forth. Then do the same for source B and then come to an overall judgment as to how useful these sources are. Pause the video now while you come up with your answer. You'll want to spend a maximum of 12 minutes doing this unless you know that you are entitled to extra time within the exam. Then we'll have a look at an example answer. Let's have a look at our example answer then. I'm going to kick off with a paragraph on Source A. From the diary of Sapper J. Davy, Royal Engineers, 10th of May 1915. Sappers are engineers within the army. Not many hours went by before we were shelled out of this position as I had to come farther back. I don't know how we have fared in the firing line. We sent out at night and put some wire entanglements in front of the trenches. The sights were too awful for words. In our advance trench, when the flares went up, we could see how things really were. Numbers of poor fellows lay in the bottom of the trench, the wounded amongst the dead crying for water and the stretcher bearers. Some have been waiting a day and a half to be brought in. So let's consider the nature of the inquiry again. The impact of the nature of the fighting on caring for the wounded. How useful is this source? In some ways, source A is very useful for the inquiry. The source indicates that the conditions in the trenches and the difficulty of moving the wounded through them had a negative impact on the caring for the wounded. The source says that men had been waiting a day and a half to be brought in. This is useful for the inquiry as it shows a specific problem caused by the nature of trench warfare and that men in the front lines might not be able to be transported rearwards. Okay, notice here that I've made a point about the inquiry. I've given an example and in fact a quote from the source that explained how that shows a problem. The provenance also makes this source useful. Remember, the provenance is the background information to the source. Sapper Davy was an eyewitness to these events, and diaries are often private and personal recollections, and so the author is likely to be both accurate and truthful in the account. From my own knowledge, I know that the trench systems were cramped, confusing and hard to move through, and the wounded had to travel at least 200 metres to the rear to reach the dressing stations. All right, in this section here, I've referred to the provenance, in this case, the author and the origin, and his access to information. And I've compared this to things that I know from my own knowledge. All of this will count towards good marks in this style of question. However, there are some limitations. Although the situation described is true of May 1915, it does not tell us how the changing nature of the war by 1918 would affect this, or whether improvements were made to cope with the conditions. And here, as we can see, I've looked at the limitations as well, providing a bit of balance to my answer. So far, so good. 
but I've only dealt with source A so far, and so I can't get full marks from this. Let's have a look at source B too. But before we move on, pause the video and make any necessary improvements to your own answer. I'm now going to have a look at source B. By the way, it's perfectly acceptable for you to deal with sources A and B together within your paragraphs, but for clarity's sake, I'm going to do them separately. Source B, from the letters of Reverend John Walker, an army chaplain, uh, a chaplain is like a vicar, a minister of religion who works for the army, who worked at a casualty clearing station at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. You may already have some knowledge of the Battle of the Somme. 1st of July, we have 1,500 in and still they come. 300 to 400 officers. It is a sight. Chaps with fearful wounds lying in agony, many so patient, some make a, no a noise. One goes to a stretcher, lays one's hand to the forehead, cold. Strike a match, he is dead. 2nd of July. Saddest place of all is the moribund ward. Low, large tents laced together, packed with dying officers and men. Here they lie, giving up, given up as hopeless. Of course, they do not know it. 3rd of July. Now I know something of the horrors of war. The staff is redoubled, but what of that? Imagine 1,000 wounded each day. The surgeons are beginning to get sleep because after working night and day, they realise that they might have to be at this for some months. In some ways, Source B is also useful for the inquiry. The source shows the effect of World War I weaponry and the huge casualty figures involved when it says that we have 1,500 and they still come. Fearful wounds. It also gives some indication that pressures were so great that some men were given up as hopeless and left to die on moribund wards. So could, um, help could be prioritised to those most likely to survive. Finally, the source gives an indication of how long ongoing battles uh, of World War I meant uh, medical staff knew they might have to be m uh, at this for months. Notice that I've used specific examples and quotes from the source here to illustrate the points that I'm making. Let's consider the provenance on this source too. The fact that Reverend Walker was an eyewitness is also useful. An army chaplain would have experience of working at medical sites such as this, even though they weren't medical staff. Additionally, from my own knowledge, I know that the Battle of the Somme lasted between July and September 1916, and on the first day there were over 60,000 casualties, which supports the information in the source. Lastly, the limitations. However, there are limitations. For example, we do not know how typical this was of other battles. In addition, a chaplain was not a medical officer and would possibly have less experience with treating the wounded than he would praying with the dying, distorting his view. OK, so again, just like last time, I've given some specific examples and related it to the inquiry. I've considered the importance of the provenance and related it to my own knowledge. And lastly, I've considered some limitations. So surely we're done now. Well, not quite. But pause the video here and make some improvements to your handling of source B. Let's consider drawing it together then. We've been asked to deal with these two sources together, so let's do that in a conclusion. Overall, both sources are very useful for the inquiry. There we are, I've answered it very directly. Together, they show that both the nature of trench warfare and conditions at the front, combined with the threat of new weapons and the scale and length of battles, had a huge effect on care for the wounded. Firstly, as shown in source A, it made it hard to get them to treatment. And secondly, as shown in source B, it shows vividly how much pressure this placed on medical services. As both sources are eyewitness accounts from the mid-years of the war, it is likely that the authors had a detailed knowledge of these conditions, making them useful, even if the conditions described may not be typical in every respect. OK, pause the video once more and make some improvements to your conclusion, or add one in if you forgot to do one. And here is the answer in full. By all means, have a look at this full screen and in HD so it's nice and clear. One thing I would point out here, you wouldn't necessarily have to write this much to get full marks. But let's remember the provenance of this video and the purpose of it in particular. I'm trying to give you as many ideas that you could use with these sources as possible, and there are way more out there. So don't be afraid if you can't write quite this much. You probably won't need to. But I have tried to give you a really detailed breakdown of how you might deal with both sources and have a balanced conclusion at the end that gives you a sense of how useful these sources are. All right, once you're finished with this answer and making your improvements, we'll move on. Lastly, evaluating the dangers. The main dangers from the terrain in World War I were as follows. 
The wounded sometimes had to be collected from no man's land. This means it might be done at night or under enemy fire. No man's land and the trenches could be deep in mud, making movement difficult and dangerous. Shell craters, sometimes flooded, made transporting the wounded difficult. The trench system could be clogged with men and equipment. Moving stretches around the many corners was very difficult and tiring. The number of wounded could be immense, sometimes thousands in a single day. This slowed everything down. OK then, summarise the dangers in order of seriousness, from most to least dangerous, and work from those four bullet points above. And lastly, overall, how much worse did the terrain make it for treating the wounded? Back up your view with examples. Pause the video while you complete that. Hopefully you've been able to prioritise these things. I'm not going to say that there's one particular right answer to this, but hopefully you can actually back it up and decide for yourself. But did the terrain make it worse? Undoubtedly it did. Trench warfare was bad at the best of times, but when you combine that with the often muddy, cramped and slow conditions that you got in World War I, it made matters only harder. Truly this was a hellish war, and industrialised warfare created the scale of casualties that made it even worse too. Hopefully that lesson has been useful to you. If it has, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more of the same. All the best and thanks for watching.